Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering the 2023 I-9 changes, new form, and verification process. I'm Katie Kreider, Marketing Specialist here at MP. And for those of you joining us on a webinar for the very first time, MP is a full-service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee lifecycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and a deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm super excited to introduce your presenters for today's program, Paul Corellis and Sharon. Paul has over a decade of experience in the HR consulting space. Working with businesses of all sizes and industries, Paul leads a team of SHRM certified HR professionals at NP. Together, they assist clients with compliance, training, and HR guidance and support for the full employee lifecycle. Paul also spearheads NP's employee retention tax credit services, and this initiative has helped thousands of clients claim over $100 million in refundable advanceable tax credits. Sharon is a SHRM PHR certified human resources professional with over two decades of experience. With a BA in psychology concentrating in industrial and organizational psychology, Sharon gained her HR knowledge from many different industries, such as nonprofits, small businesses, and large corporations. While serving as their in-house HR generalist, over 16 years ago, Sharon ventured into the HR consulting role, partnering with businesses that have both local and global presence. Sharon joined MPHR services team in April 2023, and with her extensive experience, she seamlessly transitioned into the role of senior HR partner, offering clients assistance in the areas of compliance, strategic planning, training, and other human resource needs. And just a few more housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the pro program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, and we will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today along with the slides. So with all of that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Sharon. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very happy to have you join us today on this Form I-9 Employment Eligibility Verification Training. Um, there have been a lot of changes that happened with the form itself, and Right now, as of effective date, November 1st, the new Form I-9 is expected and required to be used by all employers. So without further ado, we're going to get started. So a quick legal disclaimer, this training is intended for educational and informational purposes. So while we are happy and hope that you will learn a lot today, we are not attorneys and the information should not be construed as legal advice. So for today's agenda, we're going to go through the following topics. We're going to go through the employee information and verification process, what the employer review and verification requirements are, the list of acceptable documents, reviewing what's considered an acceptable document and what types of documents can be used in combination with each other. We will also talk about re-verification, rehires, and name changes in those situations where employees have gone through some changes in their personal life, they've gone through name changes, or they've been rehired into the company. And also, we're all going to talk about permanent virtual verification. This is the brand new amendment to the Form I-9 process where employers, uh, depending on their eligibility, can perform per permanent virtual verification um, instead of doing it in person. We'll go through general tips for completing the Forms I-9. And we'll also talk about the best practices with regards to retention and storage of your Form I-9s. So just to give you a little background on what the Form I-9's history is, this is a requirement that was established in 1986 in an effort to control illegal immigration. The Congress, the Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act, also known as IRCA. 
And the IRCA forbids employers from knowingly hiring individuals who do not have work authorization in the United States. So many people ask during these presentations, well, what if we hire someone before 1986? Essentially, if anyone is hired before November 1st of 1986, they do not need to have a Form I-9 in place. So if you ever go through an audit and auditors ask about these types of individuals who've been with you before November 1st, 1986, rest assured that you are in compliance and that you are not required to have a Form I-9 in place for those particular employees. So who is eligible to work in the United States? Basically, all citizens of the United States are eligible to work, as well as non-citizen nationals of the United States, anyone who is considered a lawful permanent resident, and also non-citizens authorized to work, as long as they are able to show the acceptable documents that, that, that indicates that they are legally able to work for a U.S. company. So what the employment eligibility verification provision says is that it's to verify the identity and employment authorization documents. You need to complete and retain a Form I-9 for each employee. So as long as they are on your payroll, they are considered employees of the company, in which case those individuals do need to have a Form I-9 completed and on file. And it's also to refrain from discriminating against individuals on the basis of actual or perceived national origin, citizenship, or immigration status. The Form I-9 basically helps verify whether individuals are authorized to work in the United States. Employers who knowingly violate or circumvent the Form I-9 process or anti-discrimination requirements may be subject to civil and or criminal penalties. So as I mentioned before, all US citizens um, um, employers must have Form I-9s on file for all current employees. You may delegate the authority to complete Form I-9 to a responsible agent. However, you will need to retain the liability for any errors make available the complete instructions to the form and the list of acceptable documents and acceptable receipts, which we will also talk about in today's presentation. Also with newly hired employees, they must complete and sign section one no later than their first day of employment. You may have your employees complete the form I-9 either on their first day of employment, or if you have already offered them the job and they have accepted the offer, they may start completing the first section of the Form I-9 before their first day of employment. There are certain individuals that do not qualify as employees of the company, in which case you as an employer are not required to have Form I-9s on file for them. Mm -hmm. And these are the types of individuals that you do not need to worry about getting Form I-9s done for. And these are domestic service employees working in a private household when work is sporadic or intermittent. So for example, hiring someone to come in to clean your house uh, would not be considered an employee of yours, so you do not need to have a Form I-9 for them. Anyone that you have hired as an independent contractor for whom you do not set work hours or provide tools to do the job, and these are typically vendors that you pay as a 1099 or that you hire someone who works outside of the United States, all right? So if you are a company that has both U.S. Uh, employees and employees outside the United States, those that do not work in the United States do not need to have a Form I-9 completed. When it comes to mergers and acquisitions of companies, as an employer, you can either treat the acquired workers as newly hired employees and complete new Form I-9s, or you can consider them as continuing in employment and retain the previous Form I-9s and the liability for any previous mistakes. 
So when you are going through a merger and acquisition, these are some of the considerations you must think about and determine which one of these methods would work best for you in the interest of your company and managing your new employees coming on board. Right now, we're going to dive into section one of the form, which is the employee responsibilities. This section must be completed by the employee themselves. Within this section, the employee must provide the following information. They must provide their full legal name, other names used if applicable, for example, a maiden name, or if they've changed their name in the past, then the name they were also known as before um, having this full legal name in that section. They must also include their current address, including the street name and the phone number, no PO boxes, city, state, and zip code, and their date of birth. They also must provide their social security number. Um, all, just so you know, this is optional unless the employer uses E-Verify. They should also supply their email address so that they could receive email notifications if the employee uses E-Verify and also provide their telephone number. Now within this section of section one, this is where employees need to attest what their status is within the United States. So there are several things they need to do here. And this is very important when you are verifying that the information is completed on the form. First off, on this left side of the screen, the employee must check the box next to one of the following statuses. Either they are a US citizen or a non-citizen national, a lawful permanent resident of the US, or a non-citizen authorized to work with the date employment authorization expires if applicable. On the right side of the screen, there's also a couple of things you need to be mindful of. If they chalked off number four, which means that they are a non-citizen authorized to work with the date employment authorizi authorization expires, they also need to provide one of the following items, either a USCIS A number, a form I-94 admission number, or a form passport number, including a country of issuance. Lastly, they need to provide their signature and they must date the form, All right? So the date is very important because that's one of the things that auditors would look for to ensure that the form is completed within the first, before the first day of employment. So the following responsibilities are what the employees need to be mindful of. They need to make sure that the employees um, have reviewed the information and that's provided in section one to be accurate and that the employee needs to sign and date the form. They need to note whether the, you as an employer need to note whether an employee indicated in section one that their employment authorization will expire. You need to verify, re-verify employee's authorization when employment authorization expires. Employees must present these documents on or before the date their current employment authorization expires. So as a little, as a quick tip, if you do notice that employees are indicating that they have employment authorization that would be expiring, I would suggest that you set a reminder for yourself about 90 days before the expiration date to have a conversation with the employee if they're still employed with you at that time to let them know that they need to prepare updated documents to re-verify their Form I-9s uh, within that period. Now we're going to move on to section two, which is your employer responsibilities. This section is solely to be completed by you as the employer and nobody else. In this section, this is where the employers need to review the presented documentations of the original forms that the employees will show to establish their identity and their employment authorization. So there are a couple of options. On the form, you will notice that there are three different columns. The first one is list A, which shows both identity and employment authorization, or 
there will be also list B and list C in which the employees must present one item from each section uh, to show their identity, which would be identified through list B documentation and also shows their employment authorization only, which is provided under the list C column. When examining the documents, you must make sure that the standard is reasonable and that you as a person, as an employer are not expected to be a document expert. However, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are doing your due diligence by reviewing the original documents to ensure that they appear genuine and that you have the right as employer to reject certain documents if you feel that they, for some reason, are not genuine and that there's something unusual about them, right? So if the documents appear reasonably genuine, then you must accept them. But obviously there could be situations where if you are presented a certain document, something may not look right to you, right? So some telltale sign could include a misspelling of a certain word um, or the document itself, the materials don't appear to be, um, uh, don't appear to feel or look right. So use your own best judgment, but for the most part, uh, you must ensure that you are accepting documents that appear genuine and reasonable to you. So let's go over uh, each column se um, separately so that you understand and are familiar with how to navigate through these document examinations. As I mentioned before, list A documents establish both identity and employment authorization. Employees presenting a list A document should not be asked to present any other document. And some list A documents are a combination of two or more documents. So for example, an employee may present to you a foreign passport, but in addition to that, they also need to include either a form I-94 or a form I-94 Form A that has the following. It should have the same name as the passport and an endorsement of the individual status or parole as long as that period of endorsement has not yet expired and the proposed employment is not in conflict with any restrictions or limitations identified on the form. Other than that, most list A documents are just one single format. So an example of that would be a U.S. passport is a very popular one. Um, so just be mindful that when you're looking through these documents, you refer to the list of acceptable documents so that you can identify which versions um, or which formats you're able to accept. When it comes to list B, these are documents that establishes a person's identity. And employees who choose to present a list B document must also present a document from list C. As for list C documents, this is a document that shows the employment authorization of an individual. If an employee chooses to present a social security card as a list C item, it must be un unrestricted. So many of you may have come across some cards that have certain social security cards that have certain restrictions on them or certain um, instructions. Um, if there are any different, if there are any different wordings on there besides the typical name, the social security number, of the employee and their signature, then that could be something that you could refuse to accept and you can contact your legal counsel to review this together. A social security card that includes any of the following restrictive wording is not acceptable as C document. So for example, not valid for employment, valid for work only with INS authorization, and valid for work only with DHS authorization. So if you see any of these special wordings 
attached to your social security card that's presented by the employee, then you may not um, you may not accept those. So we already talked about the list of acceptable documents. As you see on the sample form, it's very descriptive, uh, but there's also a section on the bottom of this page that talks about what types of acceptable receipts are allowed for verification for employment. So there may be occasions when employees are in a transition period during which their documents are in the process of being replaced because they are lost, stolen, or damaged. If that is the case, the following items on the screen are examples of acceptable receipts in which employees may present temporarily until the actual documents are in their possession. As you can see on the screen, most of these documents are related to Form I-94 documents, which are documents under List A. Um, so if you have any questions about these acceptable receipts, please feel free to contact us at, um, uh, or contact your dedicated HR partner at MP or talk to um, an immigration attorney for more details. When your employee provides an acceptable receipt, there are a couple of things you need to be mindful of. You could accept the receipt within three day, three business days after the first day of employment or for verification or existing employees by the date that their employment authorization expires and record the document title in section two under list A, B, or C as applicable. The one last thing you do need to also do is to remember to write the word receipt, the document title, and the number and the last day of the receipt is valid. Sometimes these receipts are valid for a few weeks. They could be valid for maybe up to 30, 60, or 90 days. It really all depends on the type of document that they are waiting to get in their hands. After the receipt expires, you should cross out the word receipt and any accompanying document uh, document number, record the number and other required document information from the actual document presented and initial and date to change. In terms of managing these acceptable receipts, you cannot accept the receipt for the application for an initial or renewal of an off of employment authorization document. However, you can accept the receipt for the application for a replacement for a lost, stolen, or damaged employment authorization document. So just to go over the list of section two responsibilities of you as an employer, you need to ensure that documents presented are the list of acceptable documents or is an acceptable receipt. You need to physically examine each document to determine if it appears to be genuine and relates to the employee. And if the document does not appear to be genuine, allow employee to present other documentation. One thing that I notice a lot of employers do, that's one of the pitfalls, is that they will they accept photocopies of some of these documents. If an employee shows up to work to complete a Form I-9 and they present to you a photocopy, you must decline that because that is not an acceptable documentation under Form I-9 guidelines. You must see the original. All right, so they bring you a social security card. It's on a photocopy uh, page. Tell them no. I need to tell them kindly to bring them, bring in the original doc, uh, the original card itself. Also on the bottom of the screen here, well, not the bottom, but in the middle of the screen here, you will notice that there's a little box here that you must check off if you use an alternative procedure authorized by DHS to examine documents. This is part of the alternative procedure uh, for virtual verification that we will also talk about later on in the presentation. 
in terms of your responsibilities for maintaining section two of the form I-9, as an employer, you may choose to make photocopies of employee documentation presented for section two. So while the employees cannot bring in a photocopy of documents, once you receive the documents in your hands, you as the employer could choose to make photocopies. It's your choice. If you choose to make photocopies, you must do so for all employees to remain fair and consistent with your I-9 practices. Um, and there's a potential violation of anti-discrimination laws that you need to be mindful of if you decide to only take photocopies for certain employees, but not, all right? So you need to, you need to make a decision as a company whether or not you are going to take photocopies for any of these documents presented to you during this process. Once you've completed the documents that you received and you filled out the appropriate columns for either list A or documents that you received from list B and C, you will then have to provide your information um, to make sure that you are um, verifying the employee, uh, the employee's work date. Okay, so as you can see on the screen, you are going to make sure that you attest that you've examined documentation and that the documentation appears to be genuine and relate to the employee name and that to your best of your knowledge, the employee is authorized to work in the United States. It's very important that you do list the employee's first day of employment in that box where indicated. Once all that is done, then it is now your turn to verify, uh, to complete the verification process by providing your information. So you will need to provide your last name, first name, title of employer or authorized representative. You need to sign next to that and you'll need to provide the current date that this form was signed by you or whoever the company representative is and provide your business or organization's name and address. If your company has multiple locations, you may wonder, well, what is the appropriate address to use? Do we use headquarters address? Do we use the employee's home address if they work from home? Or do we use another address that's closest? So you would choose the most appropriate address that identifies the location of the employer with respect to the employee. So if the employee works remotely, but reports to an office in New York, for example, then you would use the New York office location as the appropriate address for the employer. When it comes to dates, the date of your employee of the date that your employee began employment may be a current, past, or future date. So let's talk about what those mean. If it's a current date and section two is completed the same day your employee begins. The past date is if completed after your employee began employment, you enter the actual date your employee began employment. For a future date, if completed before employment begins, you enter the date the employee expects to begin. And if the employee begins employment on a different date, cross out the expected start date and write in the correct start date. The date and initial, and you also need to date and initial that correction. Now we're gonna talk about the new supplemental A. This page right now is an entirely new format of the form. In the previous form I-9s you've seen, the, you may recall seeing in the past, the preparer and our translator certification is usually located, was located, I should say, at the bottom of the first page of the form I-9, which happens to be right after the section one of the form. But now they've expanded the section to have its own page. So what does this mean for you? This may not be applicable to all of you. Um, this is mostly for those employers that have employees that needed help completing the form 
it, most likely it's because English is not their first language and they don't understand what is being asked of them. So in this case, a preparer or translator that helped prepare the form must complete this information. So employee's name must be filled out at the top of the supplement form by the preparer or the translator. And there are now multiple attestations for those employees who required assistance from more than one preparer or translator to complete section one. If that is the case, then each preparer or translator must complete, sign, date, a separate certification area. And the completed supplement sheets must be retained with the employee's completed form I-9. At this moment, I am going to turn this presentation over to my co-host, Paul Corrales. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was excellent. Um, ton of information, but you went through it at a, a great pace. Um, so I'll do my best to, to continue <laughs> the good work there. So, uh, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Got a lot of people on, on the call today. That's great. Um, certainly a very important topic, as Sharon mentioned. You do not need to be using this new form that we're going over. Um, but I will dive right in. So uh, this new supplement B is going to be essentially the equivalent of what you may or may not remember as section three on the second page of the old version of the I-9. So this is something that depending on your circumstance, depending on your workforce and depending on your demographics, you may or may not have experience with in the past. So when you will be using the supplement B will be when you need to re-verify someone's authorization to be working in the United States. You're also going to want to use this, and I think this answers one of the questions that's come in so far. If you have an employee who ends employment and then is rehired within three years of the original I-9, you're able to use this section to re-verify them rather than having them fill out a 9-9. You're certainly, if you wish, welcome to do a whole new I-9 for your rehired employee and, and must if uh, they've been gone longer from three years from the date of the original form. But if it's within that three year time frame, you can um, bring them back and just fill out the supplement B. If the documents that you verified and have on file are still valid, um, you can continue to use those original copies. If they are expired, then you're gonna wanna um, get new versions and make sure that they're valid in terms of the dates. You can also use Supplement B, when you have an employee who has a name change, you know, either through marriage, adoption, whatever the reason is, um, it's not required that you fill out a new I-9. If you wish to make an update, you can use Supplement B for those purposes as well to reflect the new legal name. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So when should you not be using Supplement B? That's a question that comes up often. If you have a U.S. citizen, you know, when they give you valid list B and C documents and they are a, a permanent citizen here, or if they give you a list A document, their passport, you know, when that U.S. passport expires or that driver's license expires, whatever it may be, you're not needing to revisit those folks and fill out a supplement B, formerly known as Section 3. Also, and I think this is, addresses another one of the questions that's come up in the Q&A that I was browsing, um, if someone ha is a lawful permanent resident and has a permanent resident card, um, they're, they're good as well. So you don't have to worry about expiration dates for permanent residents. And then you also don't want to use this for uh, expiration of a list B document. So those are the ones that verify identity. Okay. So when you are using this, it's really important to make sure that whatever they're presenting as part of the re-verification, you know, you're, you're most likely revisiting this because whatever that past authorization was has expired or there's some other significant change. Um, you want to, you need to make sure that similarly to when you're doing it the first time around and going through the sections that Sharon went over, that the documents are being presented for their re-verification are not expired and are valid. Okay. So as you see here, um, this is what that section looks like. Um, if it is a rehire, you're going to want to fill out that top left box there. Uh, the name, similar to, to section two, the document title, the document number, and the expiration date. Um, 
And then that box that circled on the lower right hand corner, you're going, we'll be talking about that in a moment. That has to do with the permanent alternate procedure uh, that some employers will be able to do. You're only going to check that box if you're doing a virtual verification. And whether or not you're allowed to do that, we'll be talking about momentarily. Okay. Some other considerations. Um, when you're re-verifying, if there are, are multiple dates in play, use the earlier date um, and make sure that everything is, is matching up. Um, if there is a name change or something like that, um, you, you can ask for a copy of the marriage license or whatever it may be in play um, and reflect that there, just knowing that the name may now be different from the original document. So as I said before, when you're bringing someone back, it happens quite a bit. If you wanna just start fresh, have a brand new onboarding packet for that person, have them fill out a new W-4, any state specific forms that you're having them do, the benefit enrollments, what have you, you can include as part of that process, a brand new I-9. Um, you're within your rights to do that and require it as part of your onboarding process. However, as I said before, as long as the date of that first I-9 from when they're originally hired is not more than three years from when they're being rehired, you can instead opt for the more simplified supplement B. So what you're gonna do here, um, for folks that are US citizens, non-citizen nationals and lawful permanent residents, um, again, if the document is still valid and there's no change to their work authorization in the time from their original form, you're good to go. You can use the information from that previous document that was provided. You're going to enter in their full name at the top, their rehire date, um, and then your name, name and date and sign just as you do with the original authorization. Okay. If, on the other hand, um, the employment authorization has expired since their original start. Um, you do need to make sure you're re-verifying documents. So you're going to want to get them to bring to you new versions of those work authorizations so that you can make sure that they are still legally authorized and, and not going to be a liability to you when it comes to work authorization. So as I said, Name changes are a question that comes up quite often. Legally speaking and in terms of audit and things like that, it's not mandatory that you update Form I-9 when there is a legal change in name. I will say that you know if you become an unfortunate audit victim of Department of Homeland Security and they're reviewing all the I-9s against the payroll records, um, it will likely come up as a question or they'll be looking to see, you know, where is the I-9 for this person that's showing up on your payroll journals. So it may be advisable to, to do it. Um, and certainly if the employee requests it, um, then you do need to do it if, if they ask for you to do it. Um, definitely, as I said, a best practice. Uh, uh, can't hurt to do it. And again, will eliminate some of those raised eyebrows should you be audited. One other quick thing on that, um, it's a best practice to request documentation, but within the regulations of Form I-9 um, from the, the government agency, they don't technically require presenting of the documentation to show the name change, but um, always a good idea to request that. All right, so let's talk about um, a new revelation when it comes to the I-9 process and some new options for employers. So as you probably recall, um, during COVID-19, employers were given a temporary ability to inspect employment documents for purposes of I-9 virtually. Um, for anyone who is still doing that, unless they're following the rules we're about to talk about, it's important that you stop doing that. They um, ended that flexibility as of the end of July. Also, if you did hire anyone and utilize the virtual uh, flexibility for verifying documents, technically speaking, under the rules, 
and the ending of that program, you were supposed to or were required to physically inspect those documents by August 30th of this year. So if you did do the virtual inspection of documents during COVID um, in looking to be 100% compliant, you should, if you haven't already, be asking to physically verify those documents now. That was technically due by the end of August. Um, this was obviously very popular with employers. Um, whether they needed to or not, it was a great convenience to be able to check things virtually, especially in this day and age where there are so many virtual employees and remote workers and people working in different locations or working from home. Um, just being able to not have that requirement to physically inspect a document um, is a huge efficiency boost to employers. So um, Department of Homeland Security did, did hear that and they have come up with a option for some employers to be able to continue the permanent virtual verification. So this was published this past July, just as the COVID flexibility was ending, um, made effective right after that ended August 1st. So let's talk a little bit about some of how it works and, and what it does. So in order to take advantage of this, employers do need to use what's called the alternative virtual procedure. Um, it does not eliminate the physical review for everybody. So you need to follow the specific guidelines and rules when it comes to this program. Next slide. All right, so here, here are the minimum qualifications for being able to do this. First and foremost, you need to be um, using E-Verify. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, E-Verify is a system. It is required in some states, um, not most states as of yet. Certain federal contractors are also required to use E-Verify. There's certain contracts that employers might engage in where um, they require in order to qualify for a bid that employers use E-Verify. Also, sometimes when an employer gets in, in trouble for certain circumstances with immigration work violations, they're sometimes mandated to use E-Verify as well. But um, strictly speaking, most private employers in the U.S. are not required to use E-Verify. Basically what that means is you set up an account with the government, as you inspect the documents and as you hire individuals, you enter in the information into the E-Verify system and it um, reassures you that the employee is who they say they are and they're legally authorized to work here. So in order to continue to be eligible for the virtual verification of documents, you first need to be an E-Verify participant as a business. Your account needs to be in good standing um, you do need to, for any site that you're looking to utilize the alternative virtual procedure, you need to be enrolled in E-Verify at that work site. You also have to be in compliance with all of the E-Verify requirements, um, which means you are also, before entering the information into E-Verify, that you're doing your due diligence to um, confirm eligibility for those new hires um, and their work authorization here in the U.S. There is a memo of understanding um, from, e from the E-Verify folks that list out all of the specific requirements, but these are the main, main ones here. There is also a E-Verify training that teaches employers how to spot some of the more common types of fraud, um, as well as some reminders to employers to avoid discriminatory practices when it comes to their hiring and onboarding processes. So that needs to be completed as well to qualify for the alternate procedure and the virtual verification. So what you need to do and what you can do if you are taking advantage of this, assuming you're all set, set up on E-Verify and otherwise qualify, you do need to still examine, albeit virtually, both the front and the back of their documents that they're using to attest their identity and their work authorization. So it is important that um, many people are just looking at, say, the front of a license or the front of another document. You do need copies of both sides. So that copies of that should be sent to you ahead of time. And then you then need to do a live video interaction with the individual who's presenting those documents. And 
they need to then show you the documents um, via the live video interaction as well. So you're going to have a copy ahead of time as a virtual file of front and back, and then via live video, Zoom, or, or what have you, you need to then see that those documents match what the employee has in hand as well. And now this is where that box that I mentioned before comes in handy. If and only if you're using this alternative procedure, you're gonna check that box indicating as such on the form. You are then gonna to want to, consistent with the regulations, make sure that you're keeping a legible copy of these documents, again, front and back with your records. So again, really important that you, you hang on to these copies. If you are audited uh, for your I-9s, they're gonna to wanna to see and be able to decipher these copies. So make sure they are good scans and legible. And, uh, and again, these do come up. I have gone through more I-9 audits than I care to admit with, with clients. Um, they are very thorough. Again, good, pra good faith efforts do go a long way, much like any other government audit. So um, there are clear distinctions between employers who make honest mistakes with their I-9 process and employers who they feel are acting maliciously or knowingly bringing bringing folks into their workforce that are not authorized to do so, or you know, knowingly submitting fraudulent work authorizations and things of that matter. Much different when it comes to how the audit goes and much different when it comes to potential fines and penalties. So you wanna be as cooperative as possible, but um, even for employers who are showing a good faith effort, they are pretty thorough in examining documents and will sometimes catch things that appear fraudulent to them that you know, the naked untrained eye of an employer may not pick up on. So it's important that you do include those as part of the audit. So um, again, if you're qualified, um, you're enrolled in E-Verify, you can use this, use this remote. Um, and if you were performing those virtual inspections during COVID, um, between March 20th and July 31st, 2023 is when the relaxed period was. You can continue to do so. Again, if you are not part of the alternative procedure and certified as such through E-Verify, you should be going back and, and physically verifying those documents from the COVID time period. So when it comes to the re-verification, that schedule B that we went over when I first started my portion of the presentation, you're going to want to follow the same procedures that we just went over. And again, there is going to be that checkbox in the lower right-hand corner to indicate that you were using um, that alternate procedure. So when it comes to folks who are going to take advantage of this new program, um, there is a little bit of flexibility, but you can't be too random with it. So uh, if you qualify, you can choose whether or not you're going to use it. Uh, you do have the option to continue using the physical verification for folks working at a specific site or working on site and using the virtual for employees working at other sites or working remotely or working outside of the area or even hybrid. But um, you do not want to mix and match in those scenarios. So when it comes to, let's say, folks working at the home office, you don't want to start doing some physical inspections and some virtual inspections. You need, you need to choose one or the other. Same with remote employees. If you're going to allow remote employees to do the virtual alternate, you're going to want to do it for all the remote employees. Um, there's just too much concern and risk that employers may, whether intentionally or not, be biased with who they're deciding who can do virtual and who can't. So you kind of have to make some decisions when it comes to what your process and your procedures are going to be when it comes to that. So in terms of making corrections to, a, to an I-9, employers are only allowed to correct errors made in Section 2 or Supplement B. If there's an error in Section 1, the part that the employee is responsible for completing, um, they need to make any corrections there. You do not want to see an employer making any changes to Section 1. Um, that will, will set off a red flag on an audit immediately. 
So in terms of when you need to make a correction and, you know, for purposes of this, we're, we're more thinking along the lines of a paper form, you want to draw a line through the incorrect information right near it, put in whatever the correct information is, and then initial it and date it. Um, those I've, I've, I've gone through audits that have included corrections like this. And um, at least the auditors that I've worked with over at DHS, they've been happy with, with that method, a line, a correction, a initial and a date. Um, if you find that you're marking the heck out of a form and it's it's looking more messy and there's more corrections than correct information on there, you are allowed to do a new I-9 form. Um, that's fine. If you're doing that, you, you should still attach the original to it um, just to keep a full record and show you know, why you made the decision to do an I-9 and that you weren't just doing it way, way after the original due date. I also recommend including a note or a memo to record, just explaining why the changes were made, what the error was, and, and why you decided to change it. Um, and again, just be on the up and up as a, as a general rule. Um, be honest, open and forthcoming when it comes to I-9 changes. Um, include a note, and you'd be surprised how much they can catch when, when people try to fudge some things. So don't recommend it. All right, so um, in closing, let's go over some of the general tips and best practices when it comes to I-9. First, you wanna make sure the information on the form is clear and can be read, um, You know, especially in, in cases where English is a second language or things like that, um, provided you have someone who can help translate or help prepare. Um, if it's not legible, then highly recommend taking advantage of using a preparer or a translator. Um, you want that to be, be able to be deciphered um, if it's being reviewed or audited. As Sharon went over, make sure that date in section two is the date that the employee began employment and that it matches up with the payroll record. That is something that they check and audit when they're reviewing payroll journals and the like. If you're making copies of documentation and retaining those with I-9, make sure that those copies are, are clear and are again, good scans. Make sure that all applicable sections of the form are completed. Many, many times when we do audits of I-9s um, for folks who haven't been educated on it and are just kind of doing their best, a lot of times we'll see that they have the employee fill out section one and don't realize that the employer is responsible for, for section two and having to verify those documents. So make sure that you're filling out all, all the sections that you need to and not leaving anything empty. Do make sure you're using this new version of the I-9. Again, this was effective this past Wednesday was the first. So make sure that you are using the new form. If, you, if anything is highlighted, if you put these in a binder and they're hole punched, um, just make sure that none of the pertinent information is damaged or unable to be read as a result of any markups or uh, any forms of storage. One important thing that I've also seen from time to time, if you look out on the internet, you will see that there is a Spanish version of the I-9. Employers in the mainland United States are not allowed to use the Spanish version of the form. So even if you have non-English speakers in your workforce, unless those employees are, are working in Puerto Rico, um, you do have to use the English version of the form. The, the Spanish version of the form is not permitted unless, as I said, you are in Puerto Rico. And you, you just wanna be mindful too of treating employees in a non-discriminatory manner. So we have separate trainings on, on proper interviewing and selection process. Um, just make sure that you are sticking to the list. You're not telling employees specifically what, what they need to provide, that they need to have a passport or they have to have a driver's license for purposes of the I-9. Obviously a different story if there are certain driving or travel requirements as part of their job, but for purposes of what they need to furnish for successful completion of the I-9, just stick to the list, the list A, list B, list C. And as long as they're giving you something that's on one of those forms and it is valid, um, then you need to accept that and, and move along. So um, as Sharon mentioned, Employers do need to have an I-9 on file for each employee on the payroll who is required. There are those, the 1986 date and some other exceptions that, 
that Sharon reviewed. Otherwise, you do want to make sure you have an I-9 on file for everybody. Um, if an employee no longer works with you, you do still have some retention requirements along that, um, and we'll go over that in the next slide. So the easiest way to determine how long you need to hang on to someone's I-9 is you want to use this formula here. You want to put the date that they started work, and then on line two, put their termination date. So when someone terminates, you want to take a look at three years from the date they started work. If they're terminated, um, that is the end of the retention requirement, or one year after their termination date. Whichever of those two dates is later is the minimum required retention date for their I-9. So I believe on the next slide, we go over a quick example. So in our example here, John was hired on November 1st, 2014 terminated on July 5th, 2015. Um, if we add one year to the termination date, that takes us to July 5th, 2016. Whereas if we add three years to his higher date, that takes us to 2017. So in, in this instance, the three years after the higher date is the later date. So we need to keep John Smith's I-9 on file until at least November 1st, 2017. So um, whether you choose to keep physical versions of I-9s in folders, whether you use an electronic onboarding system, or whether you've gone through the exercise of scanning all your I-9 information and keeping it in a secure database, um, the expectation from the government is that within three days of request, you are going to be able to furnish the Department of Homeland Security or any other relevant government governmental agency with copies of all your I-9s. So there is that three-day minimum. So make sure whatever method you're using that it, you're realistically going to be able to come up with that information within a three-day window. All right. So I believe we're up on time. I know we have some questions. Hopefully we've answered most of these um, throughout the presentation. What we can do is uh, review these questions. Um, and put together a, a Q&A that we can send out to all the registrants uh, to make sure that anything that we missed or anything that was specific that we didn't happen to cover in today's presentation uh, does get an adequate response to you folks. And so with that, I'll hand things back over to Katie. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. And as Paul said, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and then we'll have somebody reach out to answer your questions as well. Um, Again, a huge thank you to Paul and Sharon for your time and your expertise on the subject. To learn more about NP's full service solutions and HR um, services, you can check out our website at np-hr.com and you can talk to an MP team member there. We are having another upcoming webinar coming soon, ACA reporting, how to prepare for 2024 changes. You can visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. And to be one of the first to know of all these upcoming changes, please subscribe to our blog to keep to be the first in the know. Thanks for joining us and have a terrific day.